Hello there and welcome to another edition of The Role of Law. Do you know what your fundamental rights are? Have your fundamental rights ever been breached? And if your fundamental rights have been violated, what can you really do? Well, on this episode of The Role of Law, we are planning on discussing exactly that. And to discuss that, we have with us uh, uh, Aritha Vikramasinghe. He is the Equality Director at I Pro Bono. Aritha, uh, welcome to The Role of Law. Thank you, Shalan. Thank you for having me. Of course, Aritha, as uh, the show goes on, we will get into our discussion. But first, a slight introduction on the fundamental rights of citizens here in Sri Lanka. Human rights in the modern day can be defined as those rights without which there can be no human dignity. The term fundamental rights condenses this broad spectrum of human rights into those rights which are voluntarily accepted by any one country and assured to its people. In Sri Lanka, the fundamental rights of the people are enshrined in Chapter 3 of the Constitution. Article 10 of the Constitution guarantees the freedom of thought, conscious and religion of every citizen. Article 11 of the Constitution guarantees a freedom from torture. Article 12 states that all citizens are equal before the law and are entitled to equal protection under the law. So Aritha, those were a few of the provisions in the Constitution of Sri Lanka that lays down the fundamental rights uh, of the people in Sri Lanka. The first, uh, the right to thought, conscious and religion. Now, although this is plain and simple terms, many Sri Lankans really don't know uh, what they are entitled to under this fundamental right. What are they really entitled to? Um, Shalin, the, the freedom of thought and consciousness on their own is a very critical aspect of not just as a fundamental right, but as our status as human beings. Mm. Uh, the freedom to have our own opinions on matters, the freedom to form certain thoughts, and the freedom to have a consciousness that is not regulated or dictated by anyone else, including the state. It is, defines the very existence of you as a person mm. and of me as a person, that I have my own thoughts, my own consciousness, my own beliefs, that is fundamental to my existence because what are you and what am I without our consciousness? Right? So it's a very critical right uh, and it defines us as human beings. So speaking about a violation of this fundamental rights, could you give us some examples of how this right can be violated? So if you have, for example, a, a government requirement that every citizen must think in a certain manner, uh, that every citizen must practice only one religion and that that religion must be practiced in a particular manner. You know, that is a violation of your fundamental rights to thought, consciousness and religion. If a government tells you, um, you know, for example, you cannot have a preference of eating apples, you must all eat oranges. Right. You know, so there is a, another body telling you and dictating to you what your preference should be and therefore intervening into your consciousness and your thoughts on it. If the government tells you, for example, that you know, you can, everyone has to practice either Buddhism or Hinduism, uh, all other religions are prohibited, that's a violation of your thought, your consciousness and mm -hmm. your freedom of religion. So those are certain examples. Of course, in Sri Lanka, we don't, we have, we don't have a history of governments making such orders and, and diktats. But you do have countries, uh, North Korea, for example. Hmm, one of the where, best examples. Yeah, so certain <laughs> communist states in the Soviet right. Union, it was like that where religion was banned. Right. You know, so you were not allowed to have a religion. Hmm. Your thought process was always controlled by the state. Hmm. If you had any form of criticism, so the hmm. freedom to criticize comes from your freedom of consciousness and your freedom of thought, hmm. right? Because you have the freedom to, to express that, hmm. that comes with the, the freedom of expression. Hmm. But to have that critical thinking inside yourself, 
you have certain governments which prohibited even such thoughts. So the Soviet Union was an excellent example and North Korea is an excellent example. It's a living of, example. Is, they're living, <laughs> it's a living example of when you restrict these freedoms. And we can see what has happened to countries like that. Arif, if I ask you a very specific question, censorship laws, of course they're present in Sri Lanka as well, how do they fall into this balance of maintaining a fundamental right to freedom mm. of conscience? It depends. I mean, the, these rights can be restricted as long as their restrictions are not arbitrary and there has been due process in these restrictions mm. coming. So the freedom of speech and expression, for example, is not an unlimited freedom of speech and expression. In any democracy, any civilized society, there are certain restrictions on what we can say and how we can express our thoughts. Of course, Arthur, we will get into that uh, broad discussion when we uh, uh, discuss those provisions. Uh, moving on, uh, uh, freedom from torture. Of course, uh, this area was uh, an established uh, fact right after the Second World War uh, that saw a huge carnage across the world, massive tortures, rapes and other uh, crimes against humanity is taking place and that's what really crystallized this right. Um, what is the situation of this right and how do the people of Sri Lanka uh, benefit through this right? Sri Lanka has a major problem with torture. Uh, there are uh, historical records from the 1970s, especially when this culture of torture within the police started appearing, mm. and of course worsened during a uh, civil war and the sort of the, the riots, that. Uh, the, 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 the civil war we had, and then you know increasing um, the, the lessening of checks and balances mm. within the institutions of power. Mm. Uh, and more and impunity for law enforcement. Mm. And because of our high incidence of torture, it actually affects the average citizens quite a lot. You know, There are so many cases when people are arrested, you have the police beating them up in a police station or even outside the station in public. Mm. And there isn't enough action being taken. Of course, we have several Supreme Court judgments mm. which have penalized the police, fined the police, even to the extent of there have been cases against the police where they've been imprisoned for carrying mm. out mm. torture. But that still hasn't stopped our culture of torture. And it impacts citizens because when you go to the police station, even if you've been arrested for a crime, you want to, ha you are entitled to due process and you don't want to be beaten up by a rod or thrown into a cell and stripped of your clothing and whipped. You don't want that because it's, it's li most likely you're innocent. Hmm. And even if you're not, you're entitled to due process if you're held guilty. And it is not the police's job to be the judge and the arbiter. There's a court for that. Mm. The police's job is to arrest and then follow due process and let the courts make that judgment. And now we move on to what some call a controversial right uh, as to the presence of that right here in Sri Lanka and that's the right to equality, especially before the law. Uh, President Gotabe Rajapaksa too ran on a slogan of one country, one law. Uh, the debate on the equality before law has uh, really gone in various directions uh, with some claiming that the existence of uh, certain personal laws like the Kandian law, the Thesa Valame law uh, are a deviation from this right to equality and that it uh, propagates inequality throughout the country. How do you really get about this? I think the right to equality is probably one of the most critical fundamental rights we have mm. and which really defines the equality of all citizens of this country. Mm. You know, it gives us an equal standing. Mm. I am no more special than you are. Right. I am entitled to the same privileges as you are. Mm. And yes, I very much agree that a lot of these personal laws are in direct violation of the right to equality. The, the Thesaval Army Law, the certain aspects of the Kandian Law, the Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act, they do violate the right to equality. But they still exist as very valid laws of this country because we have Article 16 hmm. of the Constitution, right. which says that all existing laws, even if it violates these <laughs> fundamental rights, are valid. So what is the purpose of our fundamental rights chapter if you, have, if you can pass laws and you have existing laws which are, you know, Thesvarama law, for example, was codified in the 1700s. Yes. So you've literally frozen Tamil society for what it was 300 years ago <laughs> and not allowed them to progress beyond that. Um, so you, you know, 
Uh, first of all, I think Article 16 should be abolished and right. repealed, and that is critical for this narrative of one country, one law, hmm. because that is the article which is prohibiting uh, Muslim women, Tamil women, certain Kandyan women from challenging the inequality in the laws which they're forced to abide by. Uh, and, and you know, the right to equality is, 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 a, is, is quite a beautifully drafted provision mm. because it's supported by the non-discrimination provisions. Right. Um, and, and, and they are not restricted by the specific characteristics which are mentioned there, which is race, religion, political opinion, beliefs, mm. for example. So our attorney general and our courts have consistently expanded and elaborated on what the right to equality means mm. and who falls underneath it. Right. And we had some beautiful opinions from the attorney general in 2014 and repeated almost annually how LGBT people for example, the, le the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender mm. community of Sri Lanka mm. are also protected under the right to equality. Right. And, that, uh, and that discrimination against even them is unconstitutional. Right. So it's a very expansive uh, and very inclusive mm. uh, piece of legislation, uh, an article in our constitution, which really brings together the vibrant communities mm. of Sri Lanka and gives us really one Sri Lankan identity is this provision, the right to equality. So this provision, the right to equality, is fundamental if we are to really achieve one country under one law. It is, but it is conditional on the repeal of Article 16. You know, so Article 16 you says that you know, existing laws hmm. are valid hmm. even if they contravene the fundamental rights in that chapter. Hmm. So it's kind of pointless when you have uh, uh, the right to equality hmm. when you are giving the Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act, for example, hmm. superiority and precedence over the, over the, right to, over the constitutional right to equality. Hmm. Likewise, when you have uh, sections 365 and 365A of the Penal Code, mm. which prohibit unnatural sexual acts mm. and which is used to persecute LGBT people, mm. it's pointless for the Attorney General to say, look, LGBT people are protected under the Constitution when, you, when these laws, which were passed in the 1800s, mm. take precedence over the right to equality. Right. Uh, also, we do in Sri Lanka, we don't have a post-enactment judicial review. Mm. So it's not just Article 16, even the, uh, the parliament that is there right now. Of course, there is uh, no provision to bring urgent bills as yet. It's proposed to the 20th Amendment to the Constitution. It was there before. And, and we've really, we really seen uh, how urgent bills, so-called urgent bills that were passed, have really uh, moved to violate uh, this provision and many other fundamental rights of the general public. How are we to do about with that issue. Yeah, so, um, so that post the lack of post enactment judicial review is another problem. I, I kind of separated that from Article 16 because, because a lot of the existing laws mm -hmm. which violate the, which discriminates against individuals based on communities mm -hmm. and identities all date back before 1978. Right. You know, so the Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act, the Kandian Law, the mm. Salamai, the certain provisions of the Penal Code, they all date back before 1978. So mm. that Article 16 was put in there mm. to prevent these existing laws from being challenged. Then we had late in, in the 1970 Constitution, provisions were put for pre-enactment challenge. Mm. Uh, so pre-enactment judicial review of, yeah. leg of legislation at bill stage giving you know, two weeks or something for someone to challenge mm. a law. I think that's wrong. Mm. You, know, you should be able to challenge the constitutionality of a law post-enactment. Mm. And if a law is held as unconstitutional, that law should not be a valid piece of legislation. Because if your constitution is the supreme law of the land, then all other laws must be subject to that supremacy. But mm. right now, our constitutional system doesn't work like that. Mm. It's a mix of the Westminster parliamentary system, where it is parliament that is supreme, and parliament can pass whatever legislation it wants, mm. and a bit of the constitutional system where you get in the US and France, where there is some level of supremacy for the constitution, mm. but not in all matters. Right. Um, and there is that conflict, you know. It is not enough time. Uh, uh, it is almost impossible for a bill mm 
for a court to make a judgment that that a law at bill stage is going to violate someone's fundamental rights even before a right has been violated. Right. Right. There may be lots of unforeseen fundamental rights violations that can happen, mm. which you won't see at a bill stage. At bill stage, it might look like, okay, this is not going to violate anyone's rights. It's going to be fine. There's nothing unconstitutional about this When you this start law. interpreting it and applying it. Yeah, then you might see the problems right. coming out of it. So that's why post-enactment judicial review is very critical and it's very important. Moving on, the subject of arrests in Sri Lanka uh, has been controversial, again, to say the least. And this too, uh, if you did not know, is a fundamental right. You have a right to uh, be free from arbitrary arrest. And this is what the constitutional provision has to say. Article 13 of the Constitution enshrines the freedom from arbitrary arrest, detention and punishment and also prohibits retrospective criminal legislation. The words arrest or detention can be broadly defined as being deprived of a person's liberty to go where they please. A law enforcement officer can only arrest or detain a person if he has a reasonable suspicion of such a person having committed a crime. Unreasonable arrests are violations of this fundamental right. The general public sometimes really don't know the rights that they are entitled to when a peace officer comes to them and says that they are under arrest. So starting from that very initial point, uh, if an officer of the law comes before me and says, I want to arrest you, you're under arrest, mm -hmm. what are my rights? How do I react? I mean, first of all, Shalin, a police officer cannot arrest you without a valid reason. And that valid reason must be, uh, he must reasonably believe that you have committed a criminal offense. Mm. He can't just arrest you because he doesn't like the way you look or your attire. Uh, not that there's anything <laughs> wrong with it. Uh, but he can't do that, mm. you know. He must have a reasonable suspicion that mm. you have violated the law and you have committed a criminal offence. Mm. And only on that ground can a police officer arrest you. Mm. And when he's arresting you, he has to tell you what you're being arrested for. Mm. You know, he can't just say you, tell you, I'm arresting you because you've committed a criminal offence. That mm. is not enough. He mm. has to specify what offence have you, you have committed in order to arrest you. Of course, in reality, this is not what's happening in practice. Okay. You know, we've seen recently how the police has been mass arresting people for things like holding hands or kissing in public, you know, making up laws as they go and <laughs> calling it uh, improper behavior, you know, right. like those offenses which don't exist in our criminal code. Um, well, but of course, there are primary legislation that allows secondary legislating bodies to come up with rules and regulations, especially when it comes to public places, right? Um, you may have local authorities which have certain powers on limited yeah, on passing certain bylaws, but mm. the criminal offences of this country they are not coming as statutory instruments or as regulations. Yeah, the criminal the offences court. of this country are coming through the penal code, yeah. and those offences are very clearly laid out what mm. they are. You know, so the, so the, the the police does not have the right to arrest anyone on whatever grounds. Mm. There has to be a specific criminal offence that has to be committed, mm. they have to have reasonable suspicion that you have committed that offence, mm. and they have to tell you that you have committed that particular offence at the point of arrest. What about the requirement of a warrant uh, when it comes to these arrests? So warrants are generally required only when they are coming into your premises. Mm. Uh, and if they are seizing some of your personal goods. Hmm. Uh, so for those things, a warrant is required. But if they see you in the commission of a criminal offence, for example, hmm. in, in a public place, they don't need to go to court, uh, the magistrate to get a warrant for arrest. They can, of course, arrest you. Of course, in Sri Lanka, we've seen instances where uh, the police, they go to the house, and this is a real incident, uh, that happened here in Sri Lanka, in Alpitya, I believe, uh, where the police went to the house to arrest the father. The father was not at home. They arrested the son. How legal is this? Of course, it's completely legal. <laughs> uh, it's criminal, in fact. It's child abuse, right? 
Uh, so those police officers should be arrested and prosecuted for, for abusing a child. Um, and of course that child and that father should have ideally filed a fundamental rights case against the police. And this is something which we rarely see happening in Sri Lanka, is where we've seen excesses of police power uh, unlawfully, people rarely want to take action against the police or some form of redress mm. for the violations they've suffered. A lot of the time it could be because people are unaware of their fundamental mm. rights, but it is also because people don't want to be further harassed by the police and they don't want to go through the lengthy procedures of Sri Lanka's judicial system mm. where you'd be stuck in a case for 10 years mm. um, for a fundamental rights case even sometimes. So in order just to avoid that, people don't take uh, redress, don't seek redress and actually that worsens the problem because you will see police going and doing whatever they want and carrying out their mass detention campaigns without any consideration for the law due process. But Aritha, like you said, if the process is tenuous, if uh, the cost is expensive, how do you expect an everyday person, an average person, who you know, toils day and night to make ends meet to really pursue these cases for the violation of their fundamental rights? Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't expect them to, which is why they're not. You know, that, that's partly what we're trying to do with iPro Bono, mm. is we, you know, we have a collective of lawyers mm. who do free representation mm. for, for people whose rights have been violated. Right. But even then, that's, that's only so much help you can do. Uh, you need systematic change in order to end this sort of excesses of abuse of power. Hmm. We need new procedure for criminal and civil, uh, civil complaints where cases are fast-tracked. You need better funding for courts. We need to strengthen the Legal Aid Commission hmm. so that there's more funding going towards people who can't, so people who can't afford legal advice hmm. and services. So there needs to be inst systematic institutional reform which is needed in order to really make things better for the average citizen of this country. Because all these things, it is the average common citizen which is affected most by these violations, not necessarily people like you and I. Hmm. You know, we have access to resources, we have access to legal advice, hmm. we have access to the finances which can help us uh, overcome these challenges. Hmm. But the average person, I mean, you know, you're doing it through the whole government, the series, through your channel, hmm. where you're, you know, we were just discussing before and you said it's like a different country there. Exactly. You know? people's lives are so different and those people are so vulnerable mm. at the same time to abuses of power mm. especially by local police and this needs to really be stopped and on top of the entire fact that they don't have the money the time or the energy to really pursue these actions some of them don't even know yeah yeah a lot of people are completely unaware and or they are too afraid you know the system is so powerful and so empowering against them mm. But they really need to be aware that they're citizens of this country. They have fundamental rights which are given to them not just by the constitution but through their birth. Hmm. All of us as human beings through our birth we, have, we are born with certain rights. Hmm. These are universal, they can't be taken away from us. By virtue of being a human being we are entitled to those rights. Exactly. And you should not be afraid to assert that right against anyone or any force that's trying to take it away. And Aritha, your, your definition about uh, the process or the, the, the structure of uh, the law being above and beyond everything else and stronger than the average citizen really reminds me about uh, Marxist analysis of law when he uh, laid down the base and the superstructure and called the law uh, an extension that is used to mystify uh, the proletariats. Uh, let's move into the next uh, section of fundamental rights that we will be discussing, freedom of speech. Do you really have it? Here's what the Constitution says. Article 14 lays down the right to free speech. This includes a right to give public speeches and host political rallies, stage performances, compose and publish books and other publications, and even the right to freely post on social media. However, these rights are subject to the rights of others and legal limitations such as defamation, invasion of privacy and secrecy laws. 
and even includes restrictions to this right imposed through the Constitution under Article 15. Article 14 also guarantees the right to peaceful assembly and allows citizens to take part in public meetings and rallies. So the freedom of speech, can I really say anything that I want to you right now? Uh, you can say most things <laughs> to me. There is, uh, but how far really can we stretch these fundamental rights on a serious note? You can, you can go so far as what you say will not advocate to kill me or to harm me. Hmm. You know, so as long as, uh, uh, I mean, even then there isn't really, you know, it only becomes a criminal offense if I fear that what you're saying and advocating is going to be, a, is going to directly physically harm me. I can't threaten you. So you can't threaten me. So that will be criminal intimidation. Okay. Right? But you can, you can use a lot of profanity against me. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and as long as that profanity uh, stops before you say I'm going to kill you, hmm. that's legal. So the freedom of speech really uh, came into discourse, especially uh, during the time of the April 21st attacks and also with the uh, inception of um, social media platforms and uh, the mass popularity that it has gained, uh, there are certain individuals who are still uh, behind bars uh, with the uh, trials, of course, ongoing uh, for charges under the ICCPR for violations of those laws for simply posting statuses on Facebook. Mm. Yeah, so that's very interesting um, because we have other limitations to freedom of speech which is primarily the prevention of hate speech. Hmm. So that comes under the ICCPR Act, which is, which is International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And that prohibits speech which, which will incite violence hmm. or, or hatred against a particular community hmm. based on race or right. religion hmm. primarily. Unfortunately, in Sri Lanka, this act has only being used against people for the most mundane or bizarre things. <laughs> for example, we have that author mm. who wrote a series of short stories mm. on his Facebook post. And in one of those stories, there was a mention of a possible child sexual abuse in the monastic order. Mm. And that was seen as hate speech. That's a story. And it's also a new story. And it's not like the and it's a very factual thing as well mm. because you have a number of cases of child sexual abuse mm. in the monastic orders. I think that's, that's, that's common too here in Sri Lanka it's and a overseas thing. as well. You know, so are we going to be arresting, uh, for example, uh, you know, your people in your TV station for publishing a news story that a monk had sexually abused a child? Mm. Is that hate speech? That's not hate speech. You're, it's, it's a fact. Mm. It's a factual statement. Uh, then, of course, we had another arrest where a woman was arrested under the hate speech laws for a ship's wheel, you know, on her, on her dress. dress. It's a complete violation of the purpose and intention of this law. Hmm. The hate speech provisions in the, ICPP, uh, in the ICCPR Act was not enacted to arrest women for wearing ship's wheels prints on their dress. Hmm. Only innocent people for non-crimes are actually being prosecuted by this legislation. So, moving on to freedom of assembly, we saw this freedom also being restricted, especially after the April 21st attack. Of course, this was on uh, national security grounds, but how far can this fundamental right be used by the general public? Well, you have the freedom of association assembly. Hmm. So, that would in include the freedom to get together for, if it's a, a social gathering, hmm. to all the way to get together for political purposes, hmm. trade union action, for demonstration. Hmm. But of course, all those things, all those freedoms have to be uh, exercised within the confines of the law. Hmm. These aren't unrestricted freedoms. There are restrictions on these freedoms. So, for example, uh, political gatherings or demonstrations. You would, if you're, if you're carrying out some kind of demonstration, you may need some kind of police permit hmm. in order to carry out the demonstration. There may be restrictions on what times you can demonstrate. Maybe they'd assign a certain place for you to demonstrate. We've seen this now outside the president's secretariat. Hmm. So certain kinds of restrictions can be imposed as long as those restrictions are reasonable.
and they don't um, uh, impinge on the exercise of that right. Aritha, we spoke about uh, many fundamental rights uh, up until now. There's of course also a right to information that was introduced by the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, but we will not be discussing that as that was discussed on the previous shows uh, that we aired regarding the 19th Amendment and the 20th Amendment to the Constitution. It was discussed in length. So moving on to another important aspect of these fundamental rights, just the mention of these fundamental rights in the Constitution uh, doesn't really add value to it. We saw fundamental rights uh, being mentioned even in the Salisbury Constitution, but it had no enforcement mechanism which uh, really took a blow to the value of these fundamental rights. Like, What's the value of a fundamental right if it cannot be enforced? So in Sri Lanka, how are these fundamental rights enforced? So you can enforce the fundamental rights against the state by applying to the Supreme Court for relief. Unfortunately, there's a time bar, which is 30 days, mm. and which I really don't think is enough. Mm. You cannot give someone just a 30-day period from the time when their right was violated to when they should be going to the Supreme Court to no, seek relief. Of course, relief. in practice, though, the Supreme Court has the discretion to uh, deviate from this time bar. Uh, they may have in practice, but it's rarely, that is rarely done. It's, there's this 30-day time bar is, Taken is quite usually seriously. very strictly mm. enforced, at least from my experience. Mm. And, uh, and it's quite a challenge. There are a number of cases which our lawyers have assisted on um, where this 30-day time bar goes by very quickly. Mm. And what they can do in a way to stop this time from, from moving is if they file a complaint to the Human Rights Commission, okay. which will result in the time stopping, right. sort of freezing for them, while mm. the Human Rights Commission investigates. Mm. And a complaint to the Human Rights Commission doesn't need as much detail as a complaint, of to course, Supreme to the Court. Supreme Court. Mm. And it also doesn't require legal assistance necessary mm. or a lawyer to represent you. But I think we definitely need to expand this time bar. It should at least be six years I feel, not 30 days. Because in the UK, for example, you have the statute of limitations, mm -hmm. which gives you a period of six years from when a certain a violation has happened to you in order to seek some kind of redress. Mm -hmm. So I don't see if the United Kingdom can do that, or we have to restrict our citizens only to, only to 30, 30 days. days. Another thing I think which our constitution needs to address and which is silent, is what do we do when a citizen's fundamental rights has been violated by another citizen? You know, if your employer has discriminated you because of your race or your religion or your gender, you should have some kind of recourse. Now, our constitution is silent on it. It only talks about violations by the state. state. But there is obiter in a judgment, I can't exactly recall which judgment, where the, where the court does mention that if there was a violation of your fundamental right by a private citizen, mm -hmm. you can go to the district court. Now, in the 40 years we've had this provision, no one has ever gone to a district court for their violation of a, of a fundamental right by a private citizen. Mm. But I think it's probably something which we need to explore and test, mm. or maybe there needs to be some clarity brought in through the Constitution. Mm. Another amendment which I think would be quite useful is even if there's a fundamental rights violation by mm. the state, the Supreme Court should not be the first place you go to. Mm. They sh you sh because what has happened with being only able to go to the Supreme Court mm. is that you reduce the, the possibility of appellate review of judgments. Mm. And it is through appellate review that actually the, uh, the law develops. The judgment and is refined. The judgment is refined and there's richness mm. to the judgment uh, and the legal theories which come out of that. Um, so definitely I think there needs to be um, uh, some form of appellate jurisdiction over, over, over petitioning for fundamental rights. And I think another thing which is problematic is that judgments of the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal are only in English, right? See, this is why I feel there's a disconnect between the masses of this country, the citizens who are subject to the violations of their rights mm -hmm. and their knowledge of what their rights are. And this kind of, and this thinking that these rights are sort of foreign or Western mm. or NGO imposed, 
not actually a right which they're born with. Hmm. It's because these judgments are coming out in a language which the majority of this country can't comprehend. Um, so there has to be, that is why I feel some kind of appellate procedure where maybe you start at the high court level, hmm. where it is happening in the in, in Sinhalese or Tamil language, and then there is some movement, hmm. uh, some appellate procedure beyond that. And if there's at least some kind of uh, translations hmm. available of these judgments in Singhal and Tamil that would go a long way in people understanding what their rights are. Hmm. You know, the, the fact that these judgments are in a land, the fact that our Supreme Court and our Court of Appeal, they're responsible for really determining hmm. the fundamental rights of citizens, issues which affect the Constitution, hmm. and they have jurisdiction, exclusive jurisdiction hmm. over these matters. And that these judgments are coming out in a language which the majority of this country do not understand, let alone, I mean, you know, even if you can speak English, you know, English, even English judgments can be quite complex to understand. Mm. So we can imagine how someone who is not proficient in those languages will be able to comprehend it. So I think that is something which, you know, hopefully uh, we'd have some kind of uh, either constitutional change or a change in practice which will democratize uh, the, uh, the judicial process of this country. Of course, all these matters should definitely be taken into consideration, uh, given the fact that uh, we are now heading into drafting an entirely new constitution. Of course, we tried it during the past five years, didn't quite materialize. Uh, we're giving it a go again. Uh, let's hope for the best. Uh, and to see these progressive changes being made to the constitution of Sri Lanka. Aritha, one final question uh, before we go. Say, for example, I have my fundamental rights, uh, my fundamental rights have been breached. What do I really do in practice? Where do I go? How do I, how do I enforce? Well, you should rights? ideally um, seek assistance from a lawyer, speak mm. to a lawyer. If you can't afford uh, legal advice, you can come to I Pro Bono. Mm. What we do is we try our best to find you uh, a lawyer who would assist you for mm. free and who would advise you and if we see there is a very valid violation of your fundamental rights there is a strong case for us mm. and if it's a strategic case especially mm. uh, we would find you that legal assistance to, uh, to to file that petition and to to assist you on on that case if i may clarify strategic case so when we look at strategic litigation we look at cases which um, which we think will set some kind of precedence right uh, yes. For example, one of the cases which we've uh, which we've had lawyers working on is the, uh, the, the the regulation to ban women from purchasing alcohol. Uh, so th that was a very interesting uh, case because you know there was an early existing regulation which prohibited women from from purchasing alcohol. Now that couldn't be challenged because there was existing laws and you mm. couldn't challenge existing laws. Mm. Uh, and then we had new regulations which were introduced mm. which allowed women to purchase alcohol then those regulations were withdrawn and then a whole new set of regulations came in which again banned women mm -hmm. from purchasing alcohol so that gave us a window of opportunity right. to challenging challenging it based on fundamental rights because it was a new regulation and this was strategic because now we could test whether whether can whether uh, parliament or government could mm. introduce rules and regulations or laws which violated the right to equality, right? Uh, especially based on discrimination based on and gender. And these new regulations did not fall under the Article 16 provision of exactly it didn't fall under the, the, the this is what we call the grandfathering clause of, of Article 16. Right. <laughs> so that's a strategic case. Understood. Uh, so we would take up specifically. We would like to take up strategic mm. litigation cases because the. That, that means that the free legal advice and assistance we are seeking will be used uh, for something... Bigger um, than just one person. Exactly, bigger than just one person. Uh, thank you very much, Aritha, for that uh, wonderful discussion on the fundamental rights of the general public of Sri Lanka. Of course, uh, these rights uh, have much more to them than what was discussed here uh, within this short time frame. But we hope that our viewers out there uh, got a good understanding about the fundamental rights that you are entitled to and that the state must uh, protect and that you uh, can enforce these fundamental rights against the state in case of a violation and as Aritha pointed out, even in the case of a private individual.
although that has not happened too often. Thank you very much, Aritha, for joining us on our show, despite your very busy schedule. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And also thank you very much to all our viewers out there for tuning in for the substance of the law is discussed here on The Rule of Law. Until we see you again, take care and God bless.